and that will be available on our YouTube page a little later. But with that, I'm going to turn things over to Emily. Thank you so much, Daryl. Um, yes, I. for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Emily Hart. I am the... Just one second, let me get the screen share set up properly. I apologize. There we go. <clears throat> it's really great to see so many names that I already know. And for those of you who I don't know yet, I look forward to getting to know you better. Um, I'm gonna be discussing the E-Rate program today as that's one of my programs that I do here with the Bureau of Library Development. And I encourage any questions uh, throughout because this is a technical and, and moderately complicated program to cover. So if there's anything that I'm talking about that's unclear or that you simply just want me to expound on further, please uh, type them into the chat or you can uh, turn on your microphone and, and ask and I'd be happy to take your questions throughout. Thank you for letting me know that you can hear me okay. Great. All right, so yes, welcome. We're going to be discussing the E-Rate program today, which is a federal program administered by the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC. Funds for this come from, well, if you have ever looked at your your cable or your cell phone bill and you've seen the sort of assorted fees uh, and funds down at the bottom and you've never really understood or paid much attention to them, there is one that is labeled the Universal Service Administrative Fee. Uh, where that money goes is a company that is directly under the purview of the FCC called the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC for short. Um, the f these funds come to about $4 billion annually, so it is not small change, um, but it does go to schools and libraries across the country. Here's just a quick snapshot of what the uh, USAC website looks like. Um, they have a number of other programs that they also administer. There's one for uh, rural hospitals and other healthcare facilities. There are those uh, for those who are uh, below a certain poverty level. But the one that I'll be discussing today is specifically the Schools and Libraries Program, also known as E-Rate, because I am with the Bureau of Library Development, and I, I think most of those who have registered for this webinar are also associated with libraries. So what qualifies as a library, i.e. who is eligible to receive funds through this program? Uh, USAC's definition of a library is pretty basic, um, basically that they look to the Library Services and Technology Act um, and local states' uh, programs. Um, the State Library Administrative Agency, which for those of you who do not know, is also known as the Division of Library and Information Services here in Tallahassee um, that I work for. I have compiled a total document of what a, an institution must meet in order to qualify. It's available there at that short link. And I should have also stated at the outset, I apologize, um, that if uh, if you don't get these links and everything uh, sort of as they're passing, um, that you can, I will absolutely email these slides out to everybody who is registered after the webinar. So don't feel like you have to capture every single one of these as it's passing, as we're discussing it. And, uh, uh, we and like, we yes, have a question from, okay, uh, yeah, uh, asked, if you don't currently receive state aid, can you still qualify? Yes, um, all that a the particulars of the E-rate program uh, say is that you must qualify for state aid, not, not that you must be applying for and receiving it. That's an excellent question. Thank you so much. So here's a little bit more particulars about what our eligibility requirements say. Uh, a library, an institution, must uh, be headed by someone who has the MLS degree from an institution that has been accredited by the ALA. Um, 
there was there also is an expectation that libraries have an organized collection of information resources note that it does not say hard copy or digital just an organized collection that it can't be run primarily by or solely by volunteers there must be paid staff uh, it must have its own quarters i.e it must actually be solely used as a library and be open to the public during regularly scheduled hours it can't just be something that is only open you know every second wednesday under a full moon there actually have to be regularly scheduled hours uh, it can't be by appointment only and be legally established um, with public funds and what that means is that if there are private libraries libraries that only belong to for instance um, a subdivision uh, or a other sort of corporate entity this does not meet our definition of, of public libraries in florida we also include bookmobiles uh, as in a traveling branch of a library system bookmobiles are eligible to be covered under the e-rate program uh, in statute in florida statute it specifies that it must be a truck or van that carries an organized collection of library materials um, i have been sort of lobbying for a while now that we should change that definition to include just be a little bit more broad in terms of vehicle because I know there are some libraries in Florida that are doing very creative things uh, with you know trailers, uh, pop-up libraries um, that in my opinion are serving the same role as a bookmobile but are not maybe as, as um, technically or mechanically expensive to operate but currently under statute that is what it, it specifies and it has to be operated by paid staff it can't be just something you send out your volunteers in and again open to the public during regularly scheduled hours and by this for bookmobiles we know that that's a little bit of a gray area because bookmobiles uh, i think the statistic i've read is they spend three hours in the shop for every one hour they spend on the road so what this basically means is just that the bookmobile has a posted schedule um, for appearing in places it doesn't have to be a certain number of hours but there does need to be sort of a schedule of when the public can access its services and this is really a, a little bit more technical, but this is something that they have been at pains to establish uh, over the last couple of years, um, that they want to know what the square footage of bookmobiles is. Um, this may be requested by what is called Program Integrity Assurance, AKA the auditors, uh, later on in the application process. Um, and some examples that you can use to prove square footage are you could, if the bookmobile was purchased, you know, as a sort of total package, you can use the vehicle specs from your manual. Um, if not, if it's something that perhaps has been retrofitted or modified, um, you can take photographs of you or your staff, you know, measuring it to kind of serve as proof. If you are leaving that section of the application blank or just entering like a null value, you will not receive funding for it. And I, I just mentioned this as, as important because I know that that has not always been the case in the past. And I'd hate to see a library who has always gotten funding for their bookmobile suddenly not be, be receiving that reimbursement um, because they just were doing it this way they did it you know, in the past. There's an additional uh, sort of qualification that bookmobiles have to be used for educational purposes. Uh, you do have to check a box and certifying that activities, and here I'll quote, integral, immediate and proximate to the provision of library services to patrons that's a little bit vague in my opinion but i think what they're trying to accomplish there um, is that they want to make sure that bookmobiles are are serving the role of bookmobiles that this is not just a, another vehicle that the county or the city owns that's being like slapped with the label of bookmobile all right so what can you use e-rate funding for uh, they have it div broadly divided into two categories for your library uh, the first category called category one very creative naming here um, covers transmission to your building whether it's fiber um, conduit 
cable. I don't really think anyone is using dial-up, but I, I'm happy to be wrong in this case. Um, whatever the mechanism is to get internet services from your provider to the building itself, uh, basically up to the walls, is covered under category one. And this really co comes down to, you know, your bill from your internet service provider. For category two services, this is for internal connections, um, whether it's your Wi-Fi, you know, your routers, your switches, um, really any equipment needed to like connect your terminals and all your other service points uh, sort of on your library property. Uh, it can also be used to cover um, maintenance and upkeep costs. So if you hear me discussing category one and category two funding throughout this webinar, or, or really any other time, this is what I'm referring to. Do we have any questions so far? And I see some more people have come in. Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you all here today. Okay, I don't see any coming in through the chat, so we'll move on. All right, here's a really, really uh, great juicy question. How much funding can you get for your library? So they determine discount rates um, by the percentage of children in the school district that is associated with your library. So you can't choose the, you know, the, the, the poorest performing school district in your area. It has to be the one that is actually where your library is based. So the percentage of children in that school district who are registered for the National School Lunch Program, providing free or reduced cost lunches for those students. And they really use like the zip code to pin that down. And at least for category uh, one services, uh, the library's location in an urban or rural area does have a little bit to do with the, the funding rate. Um, they basically, do acknowledge that there is a higher cost, especially for category one, in getting library services to branches, or sorry, internet services to branches in, in rural areas because of that sort of last mile. And I think we are, we're all aware of, of the further you get from a population center, the harder it is to get high-speed internet. So they do provide a slight bonus to the amount of funding available for those who are, who are rural associated. Now, if you have more questions about the nitty gritty, about what is or isn't eligible for E-rate coverage, they do put out uh, an annual eligible services list. The one for 2022 was released in December, and uh, here is a link to be able to look at that. This is a list that they put before uh, the FCC commission who ultimately vote on it. And I will say, under E-rate, which I will cover some other programs later, but under E-rate, currently hotspots are still not an eligible, uh, you know, allowed service, which is a little frustrating, um, but that is what the FCC has decided, at least for this funding year. Now, I'm going to talk about some other programs that will allow you to purchase uh, hotspots and tablets and, and a lot of other sort of equipment a little bit later on in this presentation. So don't worry that hotspots are not included under at least the E-rate program. I think they're really kind of trying to keep it separate due to just like avoiding duplication of funding, but that is the current state of things. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about the process of application. And if any of this seems unclear, please speak up. Um, these, I'll talk about what is actually required. And then I also have just some tips and tricks, um, my own recommendations from having participated in this program uh, for about five years now. So this falls under the category of these are my recommendations. They are not requirements of the application process. Before you begin, it would be my recommendation that you figure out where you are, uh, if you are in the middle of a multi-year contract with a service provider and where you are in that uh, contract. If, for instance, if the contract is about to come up for renewal, that's a very different thing than it, whether or not you've just signed one. Um, 
Also, I would recommend strongly that you talk to your local procurement office or officers um, to figure out if there are local requirements for, you know, how you're supposed to, to approach, you know, vendor communications or any other procurement guidelines. I would also strongly suggest talking to your city, your county, or whether you have one in-house, your IT department, to figure out if you have a technology uh, development plan in place. It's not a requirement, but it is something that is really helpful, and I actually have some tips on how to develop one if you find that you don't. But yes, it could be that there is one very much in place and that you, especially if you're a newer director, just may not be aware of it. And also conduct a review of your existing hardware and your existing like level of service within your building or with your, your patrons. Uh, in some cases, if you're offering parking lot Wi-Fi, uh, conduct sort of a speed test out in the parking lot um, to really have the best grasp on what your needs are rather than letting someone else like a vendor tell you what your needs are. And the last thing I'm going to recommend is that you talk to your board or your advisory group or whatever, whoever sort of governs, you know, the library uh, about SIPA. And I'm going to discuss that in a little bit more detail, certainly these last two. So I had mentioned that you probably will want to do an, a technology assessment of your facility and, and what level of service that you're getting. Here is a free tool. Uh, I have actually done a webinar with them early last year, uh, the Toward Gigabit Libraries um, Improvement Plan that will help you figure out how to sort of improve your current broadband infrastructure and kind of make this plan. Um, it really is a self-paced, um, self-directed assessment. They just are providing the workbook that will give you the walkthrough as well as making recommendations for tools. I personally, just as like an internet user in my own home, found it really, really useful because I have always known there are dead spots, but I took the, the tools and the skills that were recommended in that toolkit and I kind of use them to do an assessment of my own property and I found like okay well clearly this is where I need a router because I'm not receiving good internet signal and I now have the tools to actually test that and like assign a number to how bad the internet was in one corner of my house so I found it enormously helpful just as like a, a con private consumer. So they will help you make a technology inventory so you actually know what is and isn't on your premises, as well as figuring out who should be part of your technology support team, uh, which may not just be the IT people. There may be other people in your uh, organization who really uh, have skills that you are not aware of and, and can help you. And again, yes, running speed tests, as well as figuring out, okay, here's where we're not measuring up and here's how we may want to proceed forward about uh, overall improving the services available in your library. So I can't recommend it highly enough. If you would like to listen to the webinar that I did with Stephanie and Carson from uh, the, the toolkit, I've included the link here, forgive me the plug, but um, I really found them to be, they, they're primarily have done a lot of assessments out west, but they do receive LSTA funds and they are interested in working with more libraries in the south. So if you have any questions, um, you can absolutely contact them. They're very, very uh, responsive and very helpful. And Daryl, uh, we have received a question in the chat and I think Daryl will be able to do that pretty quickly here. And yes, Jennifer, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I will also be sending these slides out to everybody who registered, which is everybody who's here, certainly, uh, after the, the webinar, so. All right, a moment ago um, in, that, in my list of recommendations, I recommended that before you even start on this journey of, of E-rate, because it is kind of complicated and, and multi-step journey, um, that you talk to your library board about SIPA because SIPA is a somewhat controversial policy. And if if it turns, you must be compliant with SIPA in order to be eligible for E-rate. And if it turns out that your town, your county is like philosophically opposed 
to SIPA, that's the Children's Internet Protection Act, um, then there's no real point in continuing too much further. Um, so I wanna dive into this a little bit. Uh, the Children's Internet Protection Act was put in place in the 90s and sort of ratified in 2000 um, because Congress had concerns about paying inter, uh, schools and libraries to provide internet services and basically Congress was concerned about children accessing obscene or harmful materials with federal money. So, in order to be eligible for E-rate, and in fact also to be eligible for some of our other programs, your library must have a policy for internet filtering and safety. Now, as a state employee, I am not allowed to recommend one filter over another that would quantify, like that would basically be me endorsing a product and I'm not allowed to do that. Uh, instead, this link here goes to the annual internet filtering and safety survey that we do of all Florida libraries. And what we do is we just ask the field, hey, are you filtering? Uh, what do you use? And you can kind of look through and see what is a commonly used filter in other Florida libraries. And a lot of people do respond to it each year. So you can kind of, if you have, if you see one that is commonly used and maybe you wanna contact some of the libraries that use it, um, I would be happy to put you in touch with those people um, or you can kind of just pick through that yourself and figure out what might work for your facility. And a lot of you are already gonna have a filter in place. In fact, if you're new in your library, you might be uh, interested to learn a little bit more about what your library has uh, historically used. For purposes of, of E-rate, uh, the internet filter you use uh, must be enforced for minors and adults um, and really on any computer that is supported by E-rate funding. So if you're getting E-rate funds to pay for you know, your internet connectivity to the whole building, it has to be on every computer that uses that internet connection. Uh, which includes staff computers. Um, the filter must also block any child pornography, which I think we can all agree, we would like filters to block that, or any other materials that are deemed obscene or harmful to minors. And that's a little bit more of a gray area. Um, it's kind of like, uh, what's that quote about art? You know, you know it when you see it. Uh, and the, the default must be that the filter is turned on. Uh, and it can be turned off if a patron uh, requests it, like if they have a legitimate reason um, to access materials that are being blocked by the filter. Um, really the, the language USAC uses, that's the Universal Service Administrative Company, is quote, bona fide research purposes, which again, very vague language uh, intended to sort of cover um, a lot, but without, substantive you know guidance as to exactly what you're supposed to do um but again the, it must be that the default is that the filter is turned on and can be turned off at request rather than the other way around additionally in order to be compliant with sipa um, you must announce and host a public meeting or hearing to discuss uh, filtering and sipa it doesn't have to be a, a meeting solely for that. You could certainly include it if you have a regular public meeting for about, you know, if your library advisory or library board meetings are open to the public, you can simply put it on the agenda. Um, and you must have documentation that this meeting occurred. Now, once you've done it once, that's fine. It can continue uh, that, that sort of, you don't have to do it annually or anything. You could have held that meeting 10 years ago, and it would still count for purposes of E-rate as having held this public meeting. Um, to just keep something, you know, the agenda or perhaps the meeting sign-in log or meeting minutes as proof that the meeting occurred. Those are just examples. I'm sure there are others that I have no uh, conception of. Additionally, if you have a filter in place, you must keep a security log um, at every branch when that, where that filter is in place, um, especially for those of you who are in larger sort of consortium or cooperatives. Um, it can't just be at the main branch. It has to be at, at every branch within your system. And you will need to keep 
a log and in some cases um, I know there are some filters that basically you get a monthly report. Um, keep that in case you ever get a program integrity assurance like site visit. Um, there, I have not heard of a lot of those happening in Florida in the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but uh, every year they, they announce, USAC sort of says like, oh yes, we definitely are out there doing them. So I don't know if that, how, how often they may visit, but they are within their rights too. And if this is your first year ever filing for E-rate funds, uh, you don't have to be SIPA compliant immediately, but your second funding year, you must be able to show that you are now in compliance with SIPA. And this is also a sticky point because if you have ever filed for E-rate in the past, even if it was 15 years ago, or I guess E-rate is now at the point where it's 25 years old, but um, if you have ever at the po any point in the past filed for E-rate, that counted as your first year, even if you're resuming uh, apl applying for it now in 2022 for the first time in a long time, it still counts as your second year or third year or fifth year. All right, I'm gonna pause here for questions uh, just to see if, if anyone has anything. All right, hearing nothing, seeing nothing. Oh, sorry, uh, Lucy has her hand up. Hi, Lucy, go ahead. Hey, Emily, um, I was wondering for these, uh, the in the event of a site visit, what mm -hmm. did you mean by the security logs? Like, um, can you define that a little more? Are you talking about the security logs for this, the filters? Yes, the security logs for the filters. I'm sorry if I, I, I don't think I specifically said that, so thank you. Um, yeah, the security log of the filter is what I was talking about there. You don't have to hold, um, you know, your, your, <laughs> your on-site physical security logs for, for a long time. No, that's fine, but what does a security log for a filter look like? I don't know what that is. Okay, uh, in some cases, and um, those of you who perhaps have filters, because I don't work with them directly, um, I have in the past at a school library, we received a monthly spreadsheet, uh, basically really an Excel spreadsheet uh, from our vendor every month of uh, things being visited that the filter had caught. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of schools have it even more often than that for the filters that they use because they actually have tighter restrictions than libraries um, about like basically catching things in real time and, and giving them to administrators and teachers. So if you have a filter in place already, um, and it doesn't have to be, they don't specify that you have to have um, a specific time frame that your logs cover, as long as you can prove that you have security logs and you're keeping track uh, overall over like general coverage. That's a really good question, Lucy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's the first time I've ever been asked that and I love that you asked that. So thank you very much. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the process of application for um, E-rate funding. Uh, the annual funding cycle for E-rate runs from July 1st to June 30th. Uh, this little graphic here, which I've borrowed with permission from my colleagues over at the Department of Management Services, who oversee the school side of things in Florida, um, covers how there are a lot of overlapping periods of what is going on in E-rate at any one point in the year. Don't worry if you don't this, I know it's a lot of moving parts. Uh, you'll be seeing this, uh, this little graphic again and again. So the metaphor, if you're like me, you sometimes need um, a metaphor for concepts to really make them sit in your brain right. Um, the 
the idea that has worked best for me to get it sort of firm in my mind is that E-Rate is like a garden. Uh, there are different seasons for each part of it. Uh, sometimes you may be working very, very hard and out, you know, in it every day. Other whole seasons may pass and everything's quiet and still, but a lot is happening sort of under the ground. Um, but everything has its season. And if you get your applications and your forms in, in the right seasons, then you're probably going to be successful. Uh, there's, you know, as with gardening, nothing is 100% certain, but it really, really increases your chance of having a bountiful harvest. Um, forgive me my fanciful explanation. So your first step in applying for E-rate is going to be to contact the Customer Support Bureau, and that number is here at the bottom of the screen. All E-rate application happens in what is called EPIC. It stands for the E-rate Productivity Center, and it is their specific platform. Uh, you cannot have access to EPIC without contacting the CSB. Uh, for those of you who might be tackling E-rate for the first time or someone else in your agency has always handled the application and you've been handed it this year, um, you may want to contact them anyway, even if you know your organization already has a login, just so that you are now like the account administrator of record and you know we'll have a, a password that works. And uh, just to be clear, because there has been some confusion in the past, I cannot uh, go in through anyone else's Epic without you giving me like explicit permission and kind of the password. Um, so I will not see uh, anyone else's Epic accounts. You really have to work directly with EUSAC for that. And here is another graphic that I, because I'm a visual learner. Um, thank you, Lucy. Uh, yes, here's another visualization of the E-rate process. Um, this one doesn't really have dates on it, so it's not quite like the other, but it kind of shows you all the steps involved. And again, don't worry if you can't take this all in right this instant, I'm going to show you this again and again. One of the requirements for participating in E-rate is that you have to uh, treat all your vendors, aka bidders, the same. You're going to file what is called um, the Request for Bids, or the Form 470, um, in EPIC, and all bidders, all the different vendors in your area or even out of your area sometimes, will have access to your Form 470. They can see what specifications you have. Um, requested for your library. Um, all vendor, I really recommend that all communication, at least during the, this, this part of the process, uh, be done in Epic so that there can't be any, yeah, any accusation or, or unclearness later that one bidder had more advanced knowledge of the project uh, than another. And that there can be, yeah, basically that one person got more information than another. And this is really going to help you out later in case anyone, uh, first of all, with program integrity assurance reviews, but also um, if there are any accusations of, of sort of untoward or violation of procurement. Um, there have been a few of those in the past, so I will say it, ha it can happen. And really doing it in EPIC it ensures that you can truthfully say like it was all handled completely above board. Um, and this includes even if you have past service providers who you've worked with, um, I know that the temptation is there. You, you know, uh, let's say to Tony, who you've always worked with, who is your um, service provider rep. Um, unfortunately, just for purposes, because this is the federal government, um, you may have to formalize that relationship a little bit during the competitive bidding process. There's also specification that in, in the language under competitive bidding that service providers um, cannot give gifts. And that includes everything from you know, a gift card to uh, free equipment or free upgrades to, of connectivity to applicants. However, they have waived this last year and, and this year because uh, especially early on in, in the pandemic, uh, in lockdowns, they were allowing more service companies to um, 
provide extra bandwidths or in some cases, some service companies were giving free equipment or loaning equipment to um, their, their entities. And uh, ultimately at that point, the, um, the realities of the situation back in uh, 2020 were that this was really sorely needed as schools and libraries were doing a lot more with remote learning. So that was okay at that point, but is no, longer. Uh, that that wave waiver is no longer in effect. Additionally, if you are being given free services, they must be deducted from the cost of the, the funding request. You can't um, be receiving it for free from the service provider and also be being paid for it, which I think goes without saying. But you know, you'd be surprised by people. So yes, I mentioned the FCC Form 470. Before, that is the actual mechanism for requesting bids for services. Um, must be filed in EPIC, and this is the last requirement. Um, once you've filed it, you must wait 28 calendar days, so four weeks after you filed it, before you can proceed with like signing um, the contract or filing for the next portion of the E-rate process. And that can trip some people up, especially now that uh, timing starts to come into play. So I just want to make sure that you guys are extra aware of uh, what's required. All right. So in this ideal situation, um, you will have gotten multiple bids, um, although I know that in Florida, especially in some of the rural areas, there may only be one service provider. So I will say if the 28 days elapses and you have not gotten more than one bid, you can then reach out to service providers directly and say, okay, look, um, perhaps you you didn't see that we had filed this. Um, so you are allowed to do that, um, just to, as long as you made the effort and provided the opportunity for bids to come in first and foremost uh, through the regular bidding process. So perhaps you've gotten multiple bids and you need to make a selection. I would recommend, it's not required, but I recommend that more than one person um, assists in making the decision. It can be, um, it can be as large or small of a group as you would really like, but it does really help matters um, to be able to avoid any accusation of, of impropriety if you had a, a team. And if you have that team, uh, and this is kind of where why I'm recommending it, um, the best proof that you followed the competitive bidding requirement is copies of communication that you might have had emails, um, you know, a note from that, the fact that you had a meeting to go over this, that will really, really help you out. Uh, yes, I have a question. Adam asks, uh, if we're in the middle of a multi-year contract, is the Form 470 still required? Adam, if that contract was uh, signed as the result of a previous, you know, for request for bids, Form 470, just to start out with, it would not be required. You don't have to do it every year in that multi-year contract. You can just link to the one from say 2020 or 2019. Um, however, if it wasn't, then you kind of are, for lack of a better word, stuck because you are in essence would be operating on a contract where no one else got a chance to bid on the services. Does that make sense? Great, yes. Um, price, while you're evaluating these bids, price should be the primary consideration. It does not have to be the only consideration. You can actually have a lot of different types. This is just a sample of a bid matrix. Um, yours doesn't have to look exactly like this or even too much like this, but um, price should be the one that is primarily um, weighted. Uh, you can see sort of the there in that list, uh, price has 50 points and everything else has a little bit less. And, but you can also have, you know, whether or not the, it's a local service provider, if that's perhaps part of your local procurement process, um, if they're licensed, uh, what the feedback is from, from the vendor, 
uh, certainly if you have prior negative experience with a particular service provider, you're allowed to count that as part of your, your weighting. You just can't, the thing that you have to give the most points consideration to, in, and it doesn't have to be points, but just the heaviest amount of weight to does need to be that it's um, being effectively priced. And yes, I have, uh, again, they have a, a document about uh, bidding matrices and how to construct them. And there are a lot of other uh, sort of examples there. So if you'd like to have a look at that, Daryl has helpfully provided the link. Additionally, in Florida, we have what is called the state master term contract uh, that is put out by uh, the Department of Management Services. They have made, uh, they've done negotiations with a lot of vendors uh, for a lot of different types of services. Basically, this is who we as the state do business with. And you are allowed, procurement law in Florida does allow you to sort of sign in using those same co contractual terms. Um, my counterparts over at DMS can actually tell you a lot more about it, about the process than I can. And I can very easily uh, provide you with their contact information. They're a great group of guys. We talk a lot. Uh, usually it's to grouse about, have you seen this? Oh, this is going to make it more complicated. <laughs> All right. So here's that graphic again. You've seen we've covered competitive bidding. And now we're going to move on to the application for discounts process. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Excuse me, I'm going to get a drink of water. My voice is going a little croaky. So USAC likes to keep things surprising. At the point where I was submitting these, uh, these slides for our approvals process, this was actually a blank and I've filled it in since then because right at the end of December, they announced that the application window for funding year 2022 would start January 12th, which for those of you who are attending the live session was yesterday. Um, it will be open for 45 days, meaning that it will close March 22nd, 2022 at midnight Eastern Standard Time. You will apply in the E-Rate Productivity Center. And at this point, at the, when you've reached the, the point of the process where you're applying for discounts, you can freely con contact the selected vendor. In fact, it's really a good idea to be more in contact now that you've selected them and are in communication. You don't have to have a fully signed contract. Um, you know, there's there's no requirement of that, but um, in the ideal circumstance, you, you might. When you are getting ready to apply uh, for funds um, and, and do that in Epic, this is some of the information that I would recommend sort of having easily to hand. Um, you would have a detailed description of services, which includes the, the price, um, also have your service start and end date, which would be in, for a lot of people, it's July 1 to June 30th, but not always. Um, as well as, you know, your contract number, your specifications for all the branches that are going to be covered, uh, which includes the square footage um, of both your buildings and also if you're going to apply for E-rate services in a bookmobile. And again, there's a link here at the bottom that will have a little bit more technical and uh, specificity than I'm kind of phrasing it right now. So feel free to go straight to the horse's mouth. Um, yes, Lucy, I'm a little bit unclear about your question. Um, if you have not yet apply, put in a request for bids, you still have time to do that. Um, I think the last day to do that would be at some point around the end of February in order to wait that full 28 calendar days before you could then submit the next form. But um, so you still have some time right now uh, to put in your form 470 and have those conversations, select a vendor as of today. Now, if you are perhaps listening to the recorded version of this and it's a little bit later in this application window, um, that 
that's another story and I'm certainly available. My contact information will be available uh, here at the end of the, the webinar um, uh, to have a conversation about what your options are if perhaps you've missed the, uh, the last date to sort of file that Form 470. Um, but yes, you would not be able to get discounts or get reimbursement later if you don't apply within this funding window. I mean, you can apply late, but your application would be considered sort of last after all other uh, applications filed in window are evaluated by USAC. Um, and you also, I think, have to have a waiver. Um, and there is a process. There's a process, it's the federal government, there's a process for everything um, for applying late and out of window, but it is more complicated. And Emily, um... Lucy has her hands up, we can um, unmute her. Oh, okay, great. I think I've just maybe answered it, but if you have any other questions, Lucy, go ahead. Um, and this might be, um, I don't know if this would help anyone else, but my question is really, um, can I, like after this meeting, apply mm -hmm. for E-rate, um, mm -hmm. make sure that the filtering is in place that they require with SIPA, but it will be my first time, so that's not necessary, I understand. Um, then go ahead and uh, create an a EPC, the EPIC platform. I don't even have like a, an entry in there. So basically, is this doable to then apply for the discounts? It is doable. I will say, um, I believe Apalachicola has applied in the past. Um, just for yes. communication. And I don't know if there is anyone from um, the E rate program on this call, but I have heard from multiple librarians that this is a real hassle. <laughs> so, and I have to say, sitting through this, that there are so many parts and like seasons. And I'm wondering, like, is it even worth it? Um, I, I tried to kind of type you a message when I was signing up for this uh, mm -hmm. training. Um, but it wouldn't take what I was typing to you. So, that oh, okay. I was thinking, I didn't see it. I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. But one of my questions was kind of, can you help sell me on this? But as sure. I start through this, it just sounds, um, it, it, I mean, it's, it really sounds like there are so many moving parts and so much that could get wrong and then put you out of whack for the next entry. Um, and I just, and and the the annoying thing to be honest is that everyone asks about well have you applied for e rate as though this is the end all be all of funding <laughs> and I just feel like you know I mean I've gotten letters from legislators and patrons who have come in and asked me about it but other librarians have also just voiced that this system is very clunky so I'm gonna put that out there as well. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say it is my my job and and my intention to make it at least a little bit more transparent. Unfortunately, the way we are set up in Florida is um, it is a local decision and a local process to yeah, apply. And I so it's your fault or, or Division of Library Services. Oh no, no, no. yeah, the like nationwide program. I mean, this just sounds a little goofy. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll hang in there until the end, and I think you and I might need to have a conversation um, outside of this meeting about what, what is accomplishable and what's realistic for you guys, because okay. I do know that you are um, kind of on your own in your municipality a little bit. So we can certainly, I don't want to sound like I'm being insensitive to the fact that, yeah, it's complicated. Um, but yeah, let's, um, let's you and me talk. Thanks. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, so the form 471 is the mechanism by which you apply for funding um, in EPIC. Uh, individual like line items are called funding requests and are numbered separately. Um, so if you have are requesting both category one and category two services, um, if you're requesting both, um, you know, Perhaps in some cases, I know that there are libraries in Florida that have to use multiple vendors because they might have multiple branches in different parts of a somewhat rural county or you know, even an urban county, and they're just not going to get service in, in every single branch from the same vendor. So each individual request for services is going to be called the uh, funding request or FRN for funding request number. 
I'm going to bring up something right now that is actually technically not required at this point in, on that graph in this process, um, the discount sort of option, the mechanism by which you'll be receiving funds. There are two. Um, they actually have snappy names, the Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement and Service Provider Invoicing, or BEAR and SPY. Um, basically what this comes down to, BEAR means that you will apply for the services directly, you will um, pay for your internet in full out of your own budget, and then receive a reimbursement, like a rebate. Uh, after all is said and done, SPY it works a little differently where your service provider um, applies for the, the reimbursement portion and they just give you a lower rate on your bill throughout the whole year. Um, again, local decision. I have heard um, about libraries doing it both ways. The ones who choose to pay the whole part portion up front and then receive the reimbursement uh, have said that it's really helpful for state aid because then they can show a greater amount of like local expenditure. Um, which puts them in a better position to receive slightly more funds through the, the state aid to libraries grants. Um, but those who use SPY just say, well, honestly, that would be great if we could do that, but uh, our internet bill would uh, is more than our whole monthly budget for everything else. So we simply cannot afford to pay the whole thing out of pocket and they get reimbursed later. Local decision, um, I would advise you at this point in the process where you're still applying your um, your request for reimbursement and probably at the point where you're uh, honestly about to sign the contract with a vendor, um, have that conversation with them uh, just in case it turns out that they're not going to allow you to do it one way or the other because it, you don't want to get surprised with that fact later. Um, program integrity assurance review will come in after the form 471. That's the, the request for, re, or sorry, the application for uh, coverage has been submitted and certified. Um, there, you will get a receipt acknowledgement letter. There's terrible acronyms for everything, the RAL. Um, PIA will kind of cover what you have filed for that is eligible versus ineligible. Um, they will also ask for documentation of your bidding process. Uh, and also there's a checkbox that uh, shows you have the abil ability to pay the non-discounted share, uh, as well as any support services that might might come in under, um, perhaps are being provided by your, by your vendor, but are ineligible for coverage. Communication with the PIA reviewer is really, really important. Um, it, can save you a lot of headache, um, and it all comes in under EPIC, uh, and you need to show that you need to be able to respond to things within 15 calendar days. So it's not the case of file the form 471, and then you're done, and you just walk away. Um, Adam, your question. Adam is asking, uh, just confirming a separate form 471 needs to be filed for each branch, or is it that each branch will have a separate FRN on a single form 471? I it's not required to do it either way, Adam. Uh, I have seen it done both ways. Um, the advantage of perhaps doing a separate Form 471 is that if there are any problems with, say, um, one branch in your library, um, it may not slow down the funding for all the other branches. Like you may have um, perhaps something that, that shows up as a little bit more complicated or problematic, and you um, would have everything else kind of existing separately. Does that make sense? But you can also, if it's simpler for you, uh, each there absolutely is no problem with filing just one Form 471 and having each branch uh, just exist as its own line item. You're so welcome. So you've been through this process. You have filed the Form 470. You filed the Form 471. Uh, you've received a receipt acknowledgement letter. Uh, you've been through any PIA reviewer questions. Um, you would then be looking to get a funding commitment decision letter or FCDLs. Again, these are in the E-Rate Productivity Center. They'll come in under the news feed section in your account. Um, and I would say it's, uh, you know, 
you can pop bottles and be excited, uh, but just take a moment to review it in case they have changed something, like are funding only your application in part, um, or they've ruled a service that, uh, that you thought would be covered um, ineligible, just to be careful. Um, you don't wanna get surprised like later with sort of sticker shock, um, or I guess in this case, receipt shock. <laughs> All right, so here's that graphic again. You guys getting sick of it yet? So services start, um, of course, there's a form for this. There's a form for everything. The form 486 uh, basically confirms that you are starting services and that you are in compliance with SIPA. You have to file this form no more than 120 days after you got your funding commitment decision letter or 120 days after your first date of service, whichever is later. Um, if you miss that 120 day deadline, USAC will adjust your uh, your overall funding request to be 100 day, 120 days prior to when you've submitted it. So if um, things, life gets in the way and you don't end up submitting your form 46 until 486, I am so sorry, uh, until say November, but your services started July 1, they would post date that and go back and sort of prorate the amount of funding you receive to be 120 days prior to whenever um, in November you filed it, which means that you might find yourself on the hook for a month of services that you thought were going to be covered, but um, they're, they're, they might deny reimbursement. It's kind of up to the individual USAC uh, functionary and how much of a stickler they're going to be. Okay, we're going to move into invoicing now. And I know, Lucy, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm mentioning a lot of things very quickly. Um, so you file the bear, which would be the uh, sort of rebate method that I was discussing before. Um, you would have in hand your funding commitment decision, your form 486 that you filed showing that you were uh, in compliance with SIPA and that your services started. There's also a form 40, 498, uh, which certifies that your payment details are correct in Epic because this is a lot of money. This is tens of thousands or in some cases for some big systems, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you want to make sure that your payment details are correct in Epic. They want to make sure that that money when they wire it to you is going to the right place. And in the case of the bear, it would be services that are delivered and paid for in full. You don't have to wait till the end of the year to file a bear. You could file multiple uh, Form 472s throughout the year, like say quarterly, if you wanna get uh, infusions of funds maybe a little more often. Um, but the payment comes via direct deposit to your bank account um, and it will arrive no more than 120 days after the last date of service. For those of you who have signed up for service provider invoicing, um, this would be a little bit different. You would still have to have that funding commitment decision letter in your Form 46 and your Form 498, um, but the service provider is responsible for filing the SPI, the Form 474. Um, for, and trust me, most service providers have whole departments who are just responsible for them getting their money. Um, so that is where it comes in. Um, as being a lot, uh, a little bit easier, or in some cases, a lot bit easier. Goodness, we're running out of time here, guys, so I am so sorry. Um, here are some takeaways. Uh, keep all relevant documents for 10 years past the last date of service. Uh, at any given point, you may be dealing with three years worth of E-rate, um, like reimbursement for last year, services for this year, and applying for next year. So it really helps to keep your records consistent and organized. And the last thing I want you to remember is I am here to help you. That is my job. Um, so if you, you find that this is getting, this sounds a little bit overwhelming, we can certainly, as we think uh, Lucy and I plan to do, have a lot of conversations about it. And I didn't pay Lucy to provide me with the opportunity to say that. Um, just important things for funding year 2022. Um, 
again, that eligible service list uh, just came in in December. The funding window just opened yesterday. The um, five-year Category 2 budget, now I can talk a little bit more about that, has been permanently adopted. And the Emergency Connectivity Fund, which again, I will talk about a little bit later, um, has been renewed. So there will be uh, emergency connectivity funds happening later in this year. So Category 2, and here's, uh, this might answer one of your questions. Um, you can get, at very least, the minimum that you might get for your library or any branch in your library um, from the period of uh, 20, in this case it'd be 2021 to 2025, uh, is $25,000 now rather than um, $10,000 as it was before. Category two budgets are going to be kind of calculated for the whole library system where they look at the square footage for the whole system, but also consider how many branches. Um, so at the very least, the minimum by the, that for the funding floor uh, is 25,000 per branch. Uh, all libraries, regardless of rural or urban status, will also receive um, sorry, $4.50 per square foot for this period and it will be uh, adjusted yearly for inflation. So what this kind of means, and I'm sorry, I've phrased it sort of backwards, um, that minimum, $25,000. However, if you have more than a thousand square feet in your library, um, they will adjust it to basically be that 450 um, per square foot. So this is kind of important for getting more connectivity in larger library buildings or buildings um, that have multiple branches. Uh, one other thing that continues to be relevant, uh, transferring equipment around uh, between libraries within a system. You are not required to tell USAC, there's no form to file. Um, however, keep documents relating to the transfer uh, and the reason behind it for at least five years and also keep those records and uh, if you decide to dispose of equipment because it's now out of date, uh, keep that asset record for 10 years and this will go into effect July 1 of this year. All right, some other resources I just want to make you aware of. I have a few of these to go through. Um, the Information Technology Disaster Resource Center. Um, Brittany Wright, who is our community engagement consultant, and myself worked with them on a webinar, uh, the link for which is at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, last fall. This is a coalition of industry professionals who volunteer in times of emergencies to bring connectivity to impacted communities. I know in Florida we're very used to hurricanes, um, but they actually work in the wake of a lot of different types of emergencies, um, floods, fires, uh, landslides. Um, they will show up, and these are uh, people who work for a lot of different types of companies, Cisco, I know, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, a lot of different service providers as well, like Comcast and Verizon. Um, they will bring power supplies, uh, hotspots, towers, CB radios for what the emergency personnel, and that includes libraries, uh, need as long as the need lasts. In some cases, they have left equipment there for like two years following an emergency. Uh, Dustin Lee, we were very fortunate to have him on, and uh, Johnny Handy, who is the Florida coordinator, and their information is right there. They would be happy, and I'm certainly very uh, open to having a discussion with you. Uh, if you are interested to know more, it can be really key, as we know, the library, getting the library back up and running, at least in some partial capacity, after a natural disaster is key. So I want to make it really clear especially if you're coming up with like a technology plan or anything, um, this resource is out there and they have done amazing work in Florida before. And I hope that we can make, if anything, uh, make Florida libraries a little bit more aware of, of their aid. Hmm. The Emergency Connectivity Fund that I mentioned earlier is still in effect in 2022. Uh, it was signed into law in 2021 as part of the American Rescue Plan Act. It is was given to the FCC to administer who handed it to, the, to USAC. And these funds will continue to be available for up to six months following the end of 
the national health emergency, which is determined by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So E-rate will cover the things that are happening in your library, on your premises, in your branches, in your bookmobile. It does not cover, and I think I mentioned this earlier, the eligible services do not cover laptops and tablets, modems, hotspots. ECF does cover those things, and it is especially intended for, I mean, we are still in a health crisis. Um, so this is intended to help schools and libraries, and they have actually upped the funding this year, so they're continuing to be funded um, to purchase the materials needed for off-site learning. So if you are interested in participating perhaps in a laptop lending or a hotspot lending program in your library, you can get funds from the federal government to cover that. I have also, as with everything else I've mentioned, I've done a webinar on it before. Um, the link is there if you would like to hear uh, me from a few months ago discussing it. I think I did that back in July, actually, of 2021. Uh, desktop computers are not covered. Um, mobile phones are not covered. There is not going to be indefinite service. Like there is a, this is a program that is intended to have an end date. Um, I'm hopeful that whenever that end date comes, that they will decide to take a lesson about how many libraries are doing hotspot programs and translate it into E-rate. I cannot predict what USAC and the FCC are going to do, unfortunately. God, I wish I could. Um, there has also recently been a change to the emergency broadband benefit. Um, it is now known as the Affordable Connectivity Program. This is less about, libraries do not have to apply for this. This is more about uh, something that you could be doing for your patrons and especially your staff. I know for those who work with patrons um, who are, have low incomes, um, they're sometimes like in the in the community, maybe the only people who these patrons may feel comfortable confessing that to. So it has been given an additional infusion of funds. Um, it was initially issued in February of 2021 um, for the uh, sorry for this program. Um, you get one monthly benefit, and this is just sort of for you to tell your patrons about. And I also have produced some infographics in the past, like flyers, if you would like to have those to hand out. Um, basically, $30 a month, which was adjusted last year, it was $50. Uh, $30 a month discount um, to be applied to broadband services or rental of equipment. Uh, for those of you who live near tribal lands, which I think we do have a few on with us today, um, it's actually $75 a month for households that are uh, on tribal lands. And it, there is also a one-time discount of up to $100 for a laptop, a tablet, desktops. Um, and there are a lot, like I know, for instance, Best Buy and Verizon and a number of others um, have registered themselves as providers for this. So in some cases, they may be like just offering it to people at checkout and it's already applied for. However, if you know of any of your patrons meeting some of the requirements, for instance, if they received a Pell Grant this year, uh, if there's anyone in the household, uh, children who uh, receive that reduced cost for free lunch or breakfast, um, if you have, again, if you are close to tribal lands, um, there are a number of aid programs that already exist through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, also there's a program called Tribal Food Distribution or if their income is um, like basically 200% of the federal poverty guidelines or less, or if they participate in SNAP, uh, Medicaid, or are already participating in Lifeline. Um, or a lot of service providers do have sort of low, uh, low income programs already. All right. One other thing that I'm just gonna take a moment to make everybody aware of, and then I promise I'm almost done. Um, the Office of Broadband underneath the Department of Economic Opportunity has recently, as in last year, launched um, a local technology planning program, uh, and they specifically mention libraries as part of their planning pool. Um, its aid is to sort of set up uh, local teams to do technology development and assessment 
and specifically, again, mentions libraries and librarians as being ideal teammates. So if you are feeling like full of energy <laughs> and you would really like to get in on this planning process, even if it's just sort of as an observer, um, just this is something to be aware of. Uh, some of their guidelines and, and aims are outlined here. I'm not going to go down the list, but uh, really it's intensely uh, focused on providing especially rural or other fiscally strained communities to figure out where the gaps are in your, your counties. And I'm sure as librarians, you're more aware of that than most. Um, and identify funding and assistance for applying for federal grants, especially those funds that are coming up as part of uh, the Build Back Better initiative or other federal infrastructure bills. And these can be grants from across a wide variety of programs may not all have to do with libraries, but they know they need to include libraries because you guys are honestly more involved with your communities and connectivity than almost anybody else. So I also, I've included their email address here. I'm also in communication with them and I'm hopeful that I might be providing a training in the coming months to kind of talk about this effort and this initiative. Um, so. Not really to do with E-Rate, but I wanted to take a moment to mention it. And last but not least, here is my contact information. I know that I will be talking to some of you probably pretty soon now um, about some of the, the concepts that I've outlined here today, and I know we're also over time. Um, so if you have questions, we can I can certainly stay on the line to answer them, but also um, I'm here to help. Uh, this is the water that I swim in. Um, so I'm happy to speak this language and try to translate it into plain English for you at any time. And you can contact me and I will, you know, we'll talk. And with that, I think we can uh, wrap it up for today. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for your incredibly good, insightful questions. Um, it's good to see some of you. I know I know some of these names I'm seeing really well, and it's great to see you guys in this context when I'm not talking to you about my other program. <laughs>